Thank you, Tina. Um, thank you for that kind and, and warm introduction. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to uh, be speaking to you all today about this topic. And my presentation titled, When Shelter in Place Isn't an Option, Environmental Health Guidance During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, just uh, before I do get started, I first want to acknowledge um, with respect the Ligwangan uh, speaking peoples whose traditional territory I have the privilege and pr pleasure of live, working, learning and playing on and whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. So as Tina kindly uh, mentioned, um, my name is Jade Yehia. I am a healthy built environment consultant with Island Health. Um, and also an environmental health officer. Um, I am going to be going through a guidance document that I created with, uh, in collaboration with the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health under secondment with them. But yes, I am full-time employed with Island Health. So let's get started. So um, what I'll be going over with you today is um, providing a bit of an introduction to the topic. Um, discussing um, the baseline health and homelessness and how those translate um, into environmental health concerns related to encampments. There's uh, many concerns that do come up with encampments and definitely want to cover off on each and every individual topic. Um, uh, and they are very dynamic and ever changing. With regarding some of the, the uh, observations and components that are noted in, um, in encampments related to environmental health, it's, there's a huge topic around and uh, communications and engagement. And, you know, as environmental health officers um, that may be involved in reviewing an, an encampment, how do we get that messaging um, and those observations that we note um, into the encampment and communicate with the folks that reside there and also um, the many other decision makers or um, actors involved in the site? I, I definitely feel like it, it, you know, one must spend some time and talk a little bit about housing being a core uh, social determinant of health and um, also want to open it up to some um, practical applications um, of employing and using this guideline and then open it up to some uh, the conclusion and some questions. So to start things off, um, you know, as we are all in this current state of being in the COVID pandemic and hearing uh, the, the constant public health guidance that is um, you know, coming into us related to staying home when ill, um, practicing physical distancing, good hand hygiene, and environmental cleaning. And those pieces and components um, just may not be possible. Um, for those uh, that are most vulnerable living on, on the streets or residing in an encampment. The definition of encampment unto itself really has connotations of impermanence and, and continuity. So there's those aspects of um, you know, uh, transience related to encampments um, while they also continue to reside in a specific location. So talking about, um, you know, before I dig into the specifics of an encampment is around baseline health and homelessness. And I just want to make note that um, just because you reside in an encampment doesn't necessarily mean that you're homeless. However, when talking about, um, you know, baseline homelessness, the state of homelessness in, in Canada, there was a 2016 report that estimated that 35,000 people are experiencing homelessness on any given night in Canada. For those living on the streets, their, their natural lifespan can be reduced by 40% compared to those living in a home. And for those experiencing homelessness 65 years and under, all-cause mortality is five to 10 times higher than those in the general population. When you compare it to the rest of the population, um, those who are homeless also have higher rates of premature mortality, especially from unintentional injuries and suicide, and increased prevalence of a range of infectious diseases, mental health disorders, and substance misuse. I think it's, you know, prudent to mention that we are in a state of public health emergency during the COVID pandemic, but there is also these dueling uh, public health emergencies related to overdose deaths in BC. However, um, actually, I was checking the stats and facts 
just yesterday, and 80% of overdose deaths in BC in 2020, 2020, excuse me, to date occurred indoors, with actually only 14% occurring outdoors, according to the BC coroner's report, so here in BC. Um, overall, you know, people become homeless through really a complex interaction between individual and structural factors, such as poverty, health, substance misuse, violence, and unemployment. And homelessness can really be a long-term state or a temporary transitional period related to circumstances such as domestic violence. So looking at the, the image on the top right, um, when speaking of the health gradient, um, being that person pushing a, a boulder of health hazard up the hill, um, you know, you can see the, uh, the tears, the, the steepness of that slope really does escalate when you're facing a myriad of different barriers, such as poverty, poor housing, lack of housing, unemployment, inadequate food or no nutrition, um, potentially lack of education, compounding the environmental health hazards that you face. So for those that are most vulnerable, who are unsheltered in our communities, they are facing the highest steepest incline on that health gradient. Carrying on on the topic of baseline health and homelessness, there's there, you know, this public health guidance and advice that we are all taking in, um, reducing our social um, interactions, being able to effectively quarantine, isolate, or practice physical distancing, and performing the proper hand hygiene. Um, those those uh, interventions are obviously compounded and um, made much more challenging when you don't have a home to reside in. There's not only barriers to accessing health services and social services, but there's challenges in receiving or following public health advice. How is that messaging coming to you when you don't have um, the different channels that are coming into uh, us with a home through media, through internet, through um, through work, th through those channels. The risks may be amplified in congregate or trans transient living. Um, really, th that can promote the transition uh, transmission. Excuse me, as far as uh, COV2, the the virus um, responsible for COVID-19. Um, because those experiencing homelessness may have ex increased exposure to others as they move between locations. Many already feel marginalized or stigmatized or have undergone trauma and, and may not seek treatment, follow medical advice, take precautions or care for themselves or others. And, and this could truly amplify transmission rates. There are also those underlying difficulties in accessing shelters, which have been compounded um, because of the, the, you know, the thinning that's being, that has occurred in shelters to promote um, uh, physical distancing and to limit crowding in overcapacity shelters. So decanting or thinning, essentially relocating people into other facilities and are leaving some without a shelter at all. You know, in my experience working in this field, um, you know, not only in developing this, this guidance document, but being that boots on the ground involved in encampments um, and speaking to those who reside in encampments, there's definitely also that stigma for some that just don't feel comfortable sheltering indoors. They may have had experiences or uh, previous experiences of violence um, in, in shelter sites and so therefore feel more comfortable camping outside. There's also, this is further compounded by COVID, um, as we have seen outbreaks uh, of COVID-19 in shelters, um, not so much in British Columbia, not at all, um, uh, you know, knock on wood, but uh, elsewhere in the country, uh, we have uh, seen them in um, Seattle, uh, or uh, Montreal, Toronto, and Calgary. So that also adds an, a further barrier, some, uh, you know, concern for people residing on the streets to you know, maybe some resistance to, to going and being sheltered in a shelter. So I really wanted to set the stage of that is, is talking about baseline health and homelessness and also, um, you know, mentioning the fact that just because you're you're homeless, it does not mean that you are one way or the other. Um, we cannot paint one brush with um, those who, who are unsheltered and, and the reasons behind why they're there. Um, everyone does have a story. And so I think it's really imp important to, to speak to that. 
But getting to kind of the root of this of this presentation is talking about the environmental health concerns and encampments. As one can imagine, and for the many EHOs that might be um, dialing into this call or, or those that may be in a bit of an environmental health background, you know, the, these, we're talking about the foundations, the, the roots of our discipline, um, access to potable water, waste management, pest control, food safety, excessive cluttering, which can further compound, um, you know, uh, proper sanitation or may exasperate um, pest related issues, the environmental exposures from residing in encampment, um, such as extreme heat or cold, um, air quality, uh, I put that in there is that has come up uh, because of, um, you know, fire, fire risk and safety, or, or those, you know, burning fire to keep war warm, excuse me. And additional um, considerations, um, such as, uh, you know, pets. So where, where are you going to put your, your pet if you're residing in an encampment? Um, those fire safety issues, overall safety and security, um, harm reduction and access to hygiene supplies, access to healthcare services, and overall outbreak planning. So I wanted to kind of share throughout this presentation some, you know, photos that uh, I've, I've taken over the years uh, in, in related to my work in, in encampment sites. Um, you know, what about water and water access? Uh, for instance, um, actually just yesterday, uh, went to our Beacon Hill Park here in Victoria, uh, where uh, camping is being allowed in the park for, for those who are homeless and observing, you know, um, folks uh, bunkering in or, or providing them supporting themselves with with water bottles so how are those being um, cleaned and sanitized and where are they getting the water from in more organized encampments um you know there has been amenities that have been possibly provided such as um providing a, a communal water source or tap so again being a, a high touch surface how is that being cleaned and sanitized and the photo on the left there is actually an instance where um someone um got very savvy and connected the water hose to the tap um kind of monopolizing the water source but also um that the hose was was sat just in the water base and creating a cross connection and potentially a, a risk to contaminating the um you know parent supply garbage related issues and concerns um it could be a whole slide um series on this and so proper waste disposal is so key um adequate disposal of um proper capacity and size but also um you know lidded containers something that can prevent pest um issues from uh, occurring what about um frequency of pickup um as there may be some residing in in encampments that uh may be binners or um prone to um dumpster picking and so can exasperate um hoarding and excessive clutter issues that would happen in a more um permanent encampment type of scenario food safety is yet another area where it almost could warrant its own um slide reel um, but how is that how is that being managed within an encampment? Um, is there um, a communal site of people um, you know cooking amongst themselves for others? Um, is there a space and place where food donations are are coming into the encampment? What about proper wear washing and hand hygiene? Um, and those who may be unwell um, potentially um, cooking within an encampment? definitely considerations um to be mindful of there okay so thank yeah, you <laughs> sorry about that everyone all right where was i all right okay um overcrowding and hoarding i'm going to move things along um i will in all honesty I, I want to tell you all these photos are not from a recent encampment they're from an encampment that i was involved in a few years ago um back in 2017 um and definitely you can see how overcrowding and hoarding definitely become became an issue this was quite an established encampment that resided um in victoria for uh, a, a, about a year um and when we are thinking of physical distancing and proper sanitation, definitely can see the challenges with a site such as this. 
But I will say there was some um, some positives to these pictures with regards actually to, um, and, and I'll get, get into this a little bit more around that communication engagement piece is um, finding some of those key champions within the encampment that can help to get the messaging um, into those that reside within it. And in fact, that was indeed the case with this particular um, site and situation that um, making some connections with social service providers and the peers within the encampment to get the messaging out um, to actually work to empower individuals to help uh, clean up. And likewise, um, you know, the, the city and province provided some of those assets and amenities to help um, uh, clean up with regards to garbage and, um, you know, removal. Pest control. Um, I think it's a, a a good segue when talking about overcrowding, waste management. Um, definitely, that can lead to um, pest issues within an encampment. So, of course, getting to the root of the problem: the food, the water, the um, the harborage um, within those encampment sites. But likewise, employing some sort of means of integrated pest management program within an encampment can really help to alleviate uh, the issue by providing um, some sort of management practices in place there. Something that I think environmental health officers and environmental health practitioners know quite well are these principles that I'm outlaying in the last few slides. So when speaking about environmental health officers, such as myself, um, you know, what, it, what is our role in encampments? It's not something that's in our day to day. You know, we are health inspectors typically doing um, inspections of food facilities, drinking water systems, uh, responding to sewage malfunction and complaints. Um, but those, those hard enge uh, engineered infrastructure, less so um, is this something that's part of our day to day in inspecting or reviewing or supporting an encampment. But our foundations, our roots in environmental health um, and mitigating some of those risks and exposures uh, lend itself so favorably to supporting an encampment. We, in our core, investigate public health hazards. So how can we use some of our foundational training and knowledge to support um, better site design and alleviate some of the risks and issues that we know can perpetuate? Um, you know, we often are the ones that receive those calls after the fact after we're starting seeing issues in, in encampments, how can we help to support, be more upstream and, and, and help on the, on the onset on the planning side of things. So we can um, consult on-site planning and, and bring some of these environmental health concerns to light to try and alleviate the potential from them occurring. We can provide some recommendations and minimize those related risks. We may be um, called to support the emergency response centers. The emergency response centers have obviously been set up related to the COVID pandemic and emergency. Um, so, you know, in my geography, there was one specifically set up to helping to house those unsheltered in the community. Um, I myself wasn't an active member, but our medical health officer was, and likewise, folks from mental health and substance use. So how can um, we you know, support them bringing some of these issues to light? So being cognizant of some of these structures, I think is so key. When, when available, um, when it is time to potentially move folks from an encampment, um, what are some um, considerations related to transportation, the, the shelter site themselves, and um, potentially the encampment of, uh, of an encampment site. And I think um, in line with my uh, Healthy Built Environment Program and uh, you know, embedded now into our Environmental Health Officer core competencies is um, advocating for longer term housing solutions. So here I am talking about encampments, but there is this much bigger picture of obviously the continuum of housing. So thinking about initial planning, and excuse my little <laughs> uh, put together, uh, cobbled together um, site plan, but actually this is a site plan of the encampment, some of those photos that I showed you earlier. And, and, and that was an informal encampment that grew organically. It was not a pre-planned encampment, but uh, I actually kind of redesigned it on how we might consider some of those amenities and assets, especially in the era of, of, of COVID. So, um, you know, thinking about uh, the overall flow within the encampment, 
just like we're all seeing and, you know, flow into a grocery store, flow into a, a, a retail. How can we think about flow when looking at encampment for folks coming in? Where are there opportunities to provide communication assets and amenities within the encampment, such as, you know, a, a muster station right off the hop upon entry that can provide uh, some communication uh, tools, some pre-screening that could be done at that uh, site, you know, providing some hygiene amenities and assets. Um, also, you know, uh, thinking, sorry, the stars that are, are, are illustrated there, the hygiene stations that could be placed and pepper throughout the encampment. So thinking about the layout, the flow, um, the size, who is being housed? You wouldn't want to have your most at risk, um, people maybe with underlying, um, you know, uh, conditions that wouldn't lend itself favorably to an encampment. An encampment really truly would want to be set up for those that are uh, obviously not um, testing positive for COVID-19. Um, and also thinking about um, proximity to services. So you wouldn't want to see an encampment set out in the middle of um, a rural area with no assets or amenities in close proximity to it. As some of you may have had the opportunity to look at the guidance document that I'm kind of going through with you today, um, there are three particular areas that um, I dug into even deeper related to hygiene, environmental cleaning, and physical distancing. Kind of the key pieces that environmental health folks are, are supporting through the COVID pandemic. So I wanna kind of give in, uh, talk about some of those specifics a little bit in greater detail. So recommendations to mitigate the spread of COVID in an encampment. The key one is hygiene, hygiene amenities, assets, and, and facilities. So asking key questions like how many washrooms are available? How many hand sinks, whether fixed or temporary? Is hand sanitizer being provided throughout the encampment? What's the frequency of replenishing hand washing supplies? And who's responsible for that? Where are showers? Um, are they provided on site or in proximity to the encampment or a, a social service um, offering those amenities in close proximity to it? What's the procedure for cleaning those showers? And how, how is it the use time staggered between individuals to prevent crowding? When thinking about um, laundry assets, uh, where are those in proximity? And uh, what's the process for cleaning or staggering use in those, um, in those facilities as well? A really great resource actually put out by the National Collaborative Center for Environmental Health, focused in specific to laundry in uh, multi-unit uh, homes and dwellings. So uh, a, a great resource that I know I've been using uh, at length um, in some of the laundry facilities related to actually some of the sheltering sites, some best practice considerations there. What about the cleaning frequency um, and um, and th that's happening within encampment. Now, this is a really challenging one, um, as it's not, again, like hard, hard engineering infrastructure that's necessarily there. But if some of those assets or amenities are being provided, such as showers, washrooms, um, water taps, um, if there is a, kind of a communal food donation space or muster station, uh, hand sanitizing locations, how are those being sanitized? Who's providing the service? Do they have a procedure for cleaning those areas? What sanitizers will be used? Um, what's the frequency? Really the best practice is looking for a minimum frequency of two times um, per day of those high contact, high touch surfaces. And if tents are being provided, this is an interesting one, what's, what's the cleaning practice for that? Um, the guidance document um, that's kind of uh, a, a, affiliated with today's presentation really gets into some, uh, some recommendations around these questions. So for instance, um, ensuring water taps are functioning um, and, and soft and being provided within an encampment, um, providing uh, sinks or hand washing stations, an ideal great ratio is one per 15 to 20 people. Um, and having, you know, toilets or hand washing facilities, um, you know, for, for more than 10 people who are residing in an encampment. And offering these um, these assets and amenities 24/7. Ah, I knew I missed a slide. So um, you know, there's some really great resources that are, are peppered into the guidance document. Um, 
for, for instance, what would a temporary hand washing station look like? Um, again, I think for the EHS on the call, probably know this well, um, you know, having that hot water uh, jug provided, hand soap, disposable paper towels, and, and uh, water bucket. Um, what are some of the um, cleaners that you want to see that are approved for use? Um, you know, a 1 in 100 dilution uh, chlorine uh, solution, um, you know, for disinfecting surfaces such as those um, high touch surfaces for more grossly contaminated, a 1 in 50 dilution of chlorine. Um, you know, there could be other alternative uh, sanitizers used, such as hydrogen peroxide or, or quad. Sorry, I'm bouncing around on my sides a little bit here. So moving on to physical distancing, you know, how will physical distancing be met? Um, if physical distancing cannot be maintained, what, what measures are put in place? And how, again, how is that messaging being translated into those residing in an encampment? Um, what communication tools are being used, such as signage throughout? The photo on the right is actually uh, of Topaz Park, an encampment, uh, a more formal, uh, pre-planned encampment that exists in, in Victoria. Um, and, you know, definitely these practices and, and principles were considered. So, for instance, um, you know, thinking about those setting up their tents and, and offering, uh, you know, best practice would say a two meter square um, distance between. However, um, the CDC in the U.S. is actually saying more of four meter square. So you're offering a bit of a buffer for people as well as thinking about storage for, um, you know, for their items um, outside of the tent. Um, ideally, really asking people to stay one one person per tent. However, if people are in a couple or a familial unit, then obviously there'd be some, um, you know, some other amenities for those uh, uh, there. Um, and offering maybe some demarcation of tent laws. And really, if an encampment is not able to provide sufficient space for each person, um, there should be uh, re some, some hard consideration for relocation um, by linking those uh, for higher risk for severe Ill illness to a sh safe shelter whenever possible. So communications and engagement. So how can we help to take some of our observations, take some of these recommendations, and, and, and ensure that they're being enacted on. Um, there's often a, probably, uh, in my experience, you know, two tiers of, of approach. So there would be an emergency, as mentioned, this emergency response center, um, which is definitely uh, a lot of the decision makers, um, you know, management, uh, looking at uh, the infrastructure that's needed and the myriad of different supports. Here I am talking about environmental health, but obviously there is a continuum of other issues that need to be considered with an encampment site. So bring those forward um, through that kind of management or leadership structure to advocate for the amenities within the encampment. But also, is there a way to, to tap in, to engage within, uh, with those in the encampment? And using trusted faces and peers can be so um, powerful. I put this this chart on the right hand side of the slide here is is also something to consider is if you are invited into an encampment and recognizing that you know many of us working in the health sector we have uh, what one discipline one area of expertise if you don't have a colleague or counterpart that may be from other disciplines or expertise there. Um, as a, as a support or maybe, uh, you know, someone that you can bounce things off of, that, uh, you know, uh, topic area may be lost in providing those recommendations. So what I'm highlighting here is some health unit support, such as our medical health officers, environmental health officers, of course, but clinical nurse specialists. What about mental health and substance use services, harm reduction, and linkages to health services not potentially being provided by the emergency response center? Also, external partners or other key party partners are housing authorities, obviously working hard to get those who are unsheltered housed into shelters, local government staff and leadership. I've had made great kinship and connections with our, um, you know, fire, fire inspectors can be a huge asset and support. Um, law enforcement, uh, you know, fire prevention, and as highlighted to mention, emergency management, outreach teams, homeless service providers, people with lived experience as well to really help um, you know, provide that perspective because they may really have some astute observation of what's going to work and what's not going to work and other supportive services. 
And this list is extracted from uh, you know variety of different um, you know guidance documents that uh, that that I look to um, to help help build this chart here. So what's the means of providing the, that communications and engagement? So identifying the key people, the role of peers within the encampment is so key. Um, looking at signage and strategic locations upon entry around, you know, uh, if there is any kind of like uh, food donation area, hygiene donation area, hygiene stations, washrooms, showers, um, to provide information and education. Um, actually, in the past few weeks, in my involvement in inspecting and reviewing, uh, looking at, um, you know, some shelter sites in town, uh, there's actually been uh, a, a bit of a request to, you know, mix up some of the signage because I think we are all in the state too of a bit of messaging fatigue and um, sometimes our eyes, um, you know, for the best of us are, are, are glossing over uh, some of the signage that we're seeing so prevalent in the community. So is there ways that maybe can mix it up so that it would, um, you know, pop out? Uh, I think uh, some, some great examples, Fraser Health Authority um, offering a, a touch of humor in there and uh, from the region of Peel, um, really clear, simple, um, but some other signage that maybe could look to. I find too in my experience in encampments is there often may be kind of that 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 organically created muster station if not one formally set up and um, you know a whiteboard or something simple like that to be able to provide information to those um, in the encampment. How can we tap into those assets? So. You know, not that I am suggesting that an environmental health professional would be have a role in each one of these steps here, but I think it's something that's really important that we need to be cognizant of is the continuum of COVID response. You know, what what about initial streaming, um, alternate places to shelter, uh, you know, overall? Um, when where is testing made available, and how is that information again being disseminated into an encampment? Um, what's the protocol for contact tracing and surveillance, especially when thinking of a more typically transient and stigmatized population? What's the protocol for transportation or addressing suspect uh, cases? What are social service providers' plans, um, you know, for their own safety um, precautions and and their own sick worker policy? What's the standard for isolation? You know, when someone is okay, maybe gone, got tested, they're awaiting their test results. Um, where are they going to be sheltered? Um, in a separate area? Is is there an isolation housing um, for for those awaiting test results, or or those um, that are confirmed COVID positive? Um, what's the plan for uh, de encampment of the site, and where will people go once the COVID pandemic is over? Um, so again, not suggesting that environmental health folks would have uh, expertise in all that arena, but I think it's a very important piece to be cognizant of this continuum and looking to um, our other health colleagues to help support um, support these pieces and make sure that that messaging is, is, is coming across loud and clear to those who need to hear it. You know, I kind of alluded to this early on in the presentation, but. Housing is truly a core core determinant of health. It's a topic of health equity and human rights. And you know, safe and secure shelter and housing with sanitation facilities are definitely preferable to anyone living in an encampment, for sure, without a doubt. Um, but you know, we are seeing them happening more and more prevalently. And I think it's an important piece that uh, there is a great deal of stigma attached to encampment. Um, this quote here um, in italicized is actually from the UN Special uh, Rapporteur um, released this year about the human rights issues related to encampment, but ensuring access to essential services, including clean water, rights to housing, health, sanitation facilities, electricity and heat, as well as support services. I, I see a lot of pieces, a lot of words popping out to me, um, core environmental health aspects that are a basic human rights issue. Um, so how can we uh, you know, act as an advocate um, for those pieces? Keep us all safe and healthy. I wanted to present also, um, again, thinking of the, COVID, the continuum of COVID response, but the continuum of housing overall. Um, what are some, um, you know, other alternatives that can be um, looked to? There's some, um, so again, some really great examples that I, I, I 
I highlighted in the guidance document, um, I definitely would encourage if you have time to check them out. One in particular is a, a, a place and space called Dignity Village in Portland, Oregon. And it is a, it, it's a tiny house village that was created um, predominantly in, a, in an industrial area and space. It does have communal washrooms, a communal kitchen, and the health department does check that health and safety standards are met. But one piece that is, um, you know, quite quite beautiful about about Dignity Village is it it is really about that. It's about the empowerment aspect. It's about um, the the aspect of of uh, creating a community and a low barrier transitional space and place to get people, you know, back on their feet um, and into more longer term housing options. Um, you know, one thing that came across to me loud and clear in my time and experience working in encampments is um, they can offer and create this space of community um, and, and bolster well-being for those residing within them. So it's something to definitely, I think, of course, be mindful of. And um, when thinking of the longer term um, continuum of housing, when thinking about, um, you know, advocating and working with local governments to um, promote health considerations in land use planning so integral to my healthy built environment um, work is is advocating for um, affordable housing options and a diversity of options within community obviously these are longer term solutions and not something that can be done in the immediate per se so you know, I, I just wanted to conclude by saying that I think linkages to safe, secure, permanent housing, you know, it is of course a priority. Um, but encampments really do pose some specialized considerations related to water, um, food access and availability, um, overall general sanitation, and the public health measures that we're all um, hearing on a day to day, um, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, staying home when ill, basic hygiene, environmental cleaning, and physical distancing are pretty key components that need to be uh, thought, thought out and thoughtful um, in encampment. And obviously, you know, I was presenting in some aspects kind of an ideal scenario, and often these are not ideal and do um, pop up organically. So how can we take a risk assessment style approach in, in thinking about what is the highest risk issues um, that need most immediate attention and then work through those uh, to have those uh, corrective actions taken on a step-by-step -step basis. So. Um, and then just a little plug for the resource that, as I said, goes along with today's presentation. I really appreciate and thank you all for your time. And uh, I might just open it up for questions. Thank you. And sorry for the, the glitch there earlier. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jade, for the wonderful presentation. So I guess we'll open up the floor for questions now. Um, if any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, and Jade, I think if you move your cursor over to the top, you might see um, a chat box bubble you can click on. You should be able to see the chat bubble there. Sure. Thank you, Tina. I do. Okay, great. So I'll we'll give um, people some time to type questions in if they have questions for Jade. And as always, if you have questions later on, you can um, either email me or I don't know if Jade shared, did you share your email address, Jade? If not, um, please email me. Um, I will put my email address in the chat box and I will forward them on to Jade. Thanks for that, Tina. No, I hadn't provided my email, but I'm happy to do so, so. Okay. So first question, um, what is the role of people like yourself in terms of advocacy? I'm here in Victoria and getting very worried that people are going to be displaced from, um, sorry, I'm not sure what, okay. Because yeah. the, let's call it <laughs> growing from the house to the unhoused. Yeah, I think that's an issue in a lot of places. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, I appreciate your question. You know, uh, I, I, I echo your worry. Um, there is uh, a, a lot of a lot of animosity uh, occurring in Victoria right now. Um, I would say, you know, I can maybe speak to a little bit of my current role right now um, is I've been, you know, working uh, as an advocate to try 
connect in with the, the city of Victoria to also advocate for these principles um, within Beacon Hill Park. There are some amenities and assets within there, but yeah, I drove through yesterday and I, I was actually quite surprised on how how um, extensive the camping in the park was. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there is, um, we, we often from environmental health, we often do field a lot of uh, calls um, from the public. So definitely try and assuade a lot of those concerns to um, speak to these uh, these principles and these advocacy pieces that I presented today. Um, I didn't actually include that in my in presentation, but yes, indeed, the Environmental Health Department would receive calls um, and uh, from the public, from the general public. So advocating for it at the municipal scale um, and then working as kind of triaging within the health authority to help support um, those within the encampment by um, potentially attending site the site and uh, connecting with those that are um, uh, leading some of the decisions and providing some education to those residing in the account as well. So really connecting in with some of our social service providers. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Susan. Thank you, though, for asking it. Question, what definition of homelessness did your references use? Was it limited to persons living on the street or did it include those persons without permanent addresses of their own but did not report living on the street? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Uh, I yes, I definitely. I think I in the presentation I was um, kind of probably directing that definition to um, those living on the street, but by no means would I profess that that is all encompassing. Um, you know, I've been involved in encampments where um, it's you know people living you know off grid more in the woods more rurally um you know couch surfers uh dealt with situations with people more living in their cars um you know uh, transients living couch surfers um one of my big concerns um in in this topic is as we are so many of us uh out there in the world are facing uh layoffs or uh, more longer term uh, unemployment, how are we going to see, you know, those numbers really uh, on the uptick and rise of people, um, you know, without, without a shelter and place to live. So uh, definitely, I, I want that definition to be much more all encompassing, because uh, I think it also gets at uh, the, the dynamicism of, of people who, who don't have a, a full time secure, stable housing. Thanks, Jade. Um, next question. Um, looking through an HIA lens, if we wanted to provide environmental health guidance to companies on dealing with COVID-19, how would we need to prepare and what would we need to do? I'm not sure if that's... Yeah, so thanks Thanks for the question, Elaine. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you're speaking uh, to companies broadly or you know, relating to to housing, homelessness, and encampments, um, maybe I'll I'll frame it such as that, um, because uh, definitely the topic of health impact assessment has come up around um, encampments or um, maybe something like a, a tiny house uh, village as well. How can um, it be more systematic to bring these myriad of actors and stakeholders together to address some of these potential health impacts? risk and also um, help to bolster some of the opportunities that could be to having people have a, a, a place to live that they're not you know constantly having to move from place to place every day and pack up all of their stuff um, and reduce and assuage some of that nimbyism that can occur related to an encampment so i think hi is a really powerful tool that could have a place in this kind of discussion um, how is there a way that we can create a little bit more of a seamless transition between an encampment into a community um, where actually uh, th there is um, not some of that um, that hate might be occurring like Susan was uh, uh, speaking to in her previous question. So I'm not sure if that answers your specific question, but I definitely think that there's an opportunity for HIA in this discussion as well. Thanks, Jade. <clears throat> Just give a little bit more time for others who might have more questions. Um, okay, there's know. another one. Have <laughs> many. Um, sorry, I'm not too familiar with the acronyms. Um, Local governments, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
as part of t um, them updating their pandemic emergency plans. Yeah. Thanks so much for the question, Janelle. Um, you know, I would say, as you probably very well know, <laughs> as a fellow EHO, um, you know, we we often are not brought into this discussion until we are starting to see a plethora of complaints um, related to, you know, water, sanitation, uh, cleaning, pests, um, waste disposal, a big one. Uh, but I will say that I'm finding more and more uh, local governments are reaching out to get upstream, uh, to get upwind of some of these impacts and concerns. Uh, so uh, working actually quite closely with the local environmental health officer and myself um, with a community of island where, um, you know, they submitted a kind of a, a site plan to us regarding an encampment site, the overall design, the layout, um, and uh, yes, so we, we've definitely been providing consultation and comments back and forth between local governments um, to offer some, some of these recommendations in the guidance document um, for them to consider in, in their overall design. So I wouldn't say it's all the time, but, uh, but definitely seeing it more, more and more. Thanks. Um, next question. Can you say a bit more about alternative models for supportive housing? Um, do you think we should focus on more modular supportive housing or more structured encampments? Yeah, thanks for the question, Deborah. Um, you know, I think, you know, looking even within the province of BC, or, you know, Dr. Bonnie Henry, um, there's a guidance note that came out related specifically to encampments. Um, and right off the hop, you know, safe, stable, secure housing is what we, we need to strive for. So I don't think a, an encampment is an ideal scenario. Um, these are less than ideal uh, circumstances. Uh, I think an encampment may offer uh, some more interim supports rather than people um, being very transient in the, in the community. However, um, you know, it can be a slippery slope. We can start to see overcrowding issues. We can start to see some of these impacts and concerns within encampment sites. I mean, Topaz Park that was, I showcased earlier on just in an image, um, it grew and was uh, close to 300 folks in that encampment and, and actually did disband because of safety related concerns. So. And I wouldn't say an encampment is, is the direction we should be moving towards. It should be safe, stable, and secure housing. But in the interim of that, in the absence of that, I, I think there really some, are some best practices that need to be considered in an encampment. Um, next question. Um, can we assume some degree of bilateral movements um, from encampments to shelters and vice versa? And what might be implications or for current context of pandemic? and how may health protection measures be put into place with that possibility? Great question, Lydia. Thank you for asking it. You know, I think uh, definitely uh, it wasn't something that I really touched on much in, in my presentation. Um, for sure, we are seeing, you know, encampments set up, whether organically or, um, or more formally. And then, um, but the ultimate goal is to get people into, into safe, stable, secure sheltered housing, like heart, heart engineered uh, shelters. Um, we are also seeing that, that bilateral movement that you suggest. Uh, some folks going into a shelter may be um, not comfortable, maybe had uh, something happen to the, them in, in a shelter, uh, you know, safety related concerns. Um, you know, th there, there may be reasons where they themselves decide to leave the shelter. And I've definitely heard instances of that. Um, you know, I think I, I think you you're very astutely picking up on the implications for the context of the current uh, of the of the pandemic. Thinking about that transportation as, uh, aspect, thinking about um, contact tracing of that particular individual. These are really um, significant challenges that I'd be probably looking to some of my colleagues um, in public health nursing um, to help uh, navigate and support, as well as um, you know surveillance and population health aspects. But I think that also environmental health, we could offer that role. And, and similarly, I have been offering that role in the shelter site. So how can we take some of these same types of principles and employ them in a shelter site for sure and reviewing a shelter with the same lens in mind, but even now the assets and amenities are there. So uh, I don't know if that answers your, 
your your particular question, but uh, I, I think it's definitely a, a big question to be asked. Yeah, that bilateral movement aspect. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. Um, now that we're heading into fall and winter, um, people might be heading more and more into shelters. And, you know, with uh, the pandemic happening, is, is there increased risk of outbreaks, too, in, in, within those indoor environments? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been, I mean, out here in BC, it's been, uh, you know, the weather's actually been quite fair for us over the summer. Um, so we're seeing these encampments uh, exist and set up. We have in the past experienced encampments where, um, you know, there's been heat advisory issues, of course. Um, so that that's a real concern. But I think about that environmental stressors piece, and I think that will become more and more prevalent for us, um, more of a concern um, as we go into the cooler temperatures and weather. And, and for any colleagues that may be calling in from out east, um, you know, that, that it's a huge issue. Of course, maybe, uh, you know, warm up spaces and places and then how do you promote you know physical distancing and and alleviate crowding within that so um yeah many of these potential impacts almost are a rabbit hole into themselves context is key mm -hmm. thanks for that jade we have about three minutes left so if you have more questions feel free to type them into the chat box uh, next question, another question came in. Um, has there been any consideration of signage that could communicate some of the positive health practices being done for the public, um, maybe helping with NIMBYs? Susan, that's a brilliant idea. Um, thank you for that. Uh, you know, in all honesty, obviously my response, no, I haven't seen that. Um, and I think that is a, 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 a phenomenal suggestion. Um, ways that can uh, alleviate and address some of that nimbyism from occurring. Um, and definitely, you know, we see these sites can get pretty contentious within those residing in an encampment and those neighboring it. Um, so if there's a way to um, provide a little bit more of uh, cooperation or communication, um, that would be incredibly impactful and, and help to address and alleviate some of the stigma issues that I spoke to earlier. So. Thank you for that. I'll definitely be taking that to home and to heart and to practice. Okay, thanks Jade. Um, thanks so much to everyone for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. Um, again, if you have more questions, feel free to email them to me and I can forward them on to Jade. Um, and uh, I guess that's uh, a wrap for today's webinar and have a great rest of your day and the weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.